Well, as mentioned in the previous teachings that we've done on 1 Corinthians, we know from the letter that the church had, in Corinth had, uh, had fallen into a real, how should you say, a bit of a pickle, right? <laughs> they were fighting, uh, there was confusion over certain beliefs and various practices and various ethical positions that all sorts of things needed addressing. And, and, and so Paul writes this letter to address almost systematically one by one the concerns that he has. But when he turns to the matter of the resurrection, which you've just read about at the end of the letter, it's clear really that he has saved the biggest problem uh, until the end. Now, the resurrection, this idea of the resurrection of the dead was not new to the followers of Jesus. In, in fact, in Jesus' day, there was a really a raging debate among the Jews about the very matter. Um, the sect called the Sadducees, who you may have heard about if you've read the Gospels before, they vehemently de denied and argued against any idea of a resurrection. While the Pharisees, on the other hand, who again, if you've read the Gospels, you've, you've encountered, they had come to believe that there would be a future resurrection of the dead. And as for the church in Corinth, they were confused, as you just read about. And as we read in verse 12, it seems that some had come to the point where they were preaching that there was not going to be a resurrection of the dead, even though you know, somewhat ironically central to the story that they're following is the resurrection of Jesus himself. And for Paul and the rest of the apostles, as we read in our section today, this was the central argument and what settled the matter of the resurrection once and for all, because it was because Jesus had risen from the dead, there was then therefore indeed a resurrection. And further, as they argue, this resurrection wasn't just for Jesus, but it was for all. And actually, it was the great hope of the followers of Jesus. Well, in the section that we're reading today, Paul, he kind of puts everything on the line. And he says that the resurrection is the central piece of our belief, and that if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, he says, our faith is futile, we're still in our sins, and we are a people who, he says, should be pitied more than all the peoples. That's quite the statement, right? But here's the question before us. Why? Why is the resurrection so important? Well, in this teaching, I'm going to attempt to give you three brief answers. And each of these answers are informed by Alistair McGrath in this great little book on the Apostles' Creed, which is the central heart of Christian belief. The book's called I Be Believe, and I want to give credit where credit is due. So first of all, why is the resurrection essential? Well, the resurrection is essential because it tells us about God. If you go back into the Old Testament, we, we read the story of how God's people began to reveal himself uh, to creation and how he formed this people from Abraham, a people that became the people of Israel. And at the heart of the story, it tells of, of how this people end up being enslaved to this foreign land, the foreign powers of Egypt and the Pharaoh there, and then how God miraculously raises up Moses and then incredibly delivers them out of their enslavement. And so the story of Old Testament, and this is kind of on repeat throughout it, really tells us about Israel. But more, when you read it, it tells us about God. And it establishes this idea, as I say on repeat, many different ways it tells us that God is our deliverer, right? The one who sets us free from our captivity to all the various forms of captivity that we find ourselves in. Well, then when you jump into the New Testament, the focus of the story, it shifts to Jesus, right? And Jesus is seen as the great hope of Israel, the servant of Israel, the, the promised king of Israel, the fulfillment of, of all of Israel. And as we encounter the story of Jesus, it's at the climax of this story that we read then of his resurrection from the dead. And when we read that, what we're discovering is that God is the one who raises Jesus from the dead. And in this, we again see that God is the great deliverer, the one who sets us free, not just from Egypt, but from our ultimate captor, which the scriptures describe as being sin and death. 
So you see, the resurrection of Jesus then is essential because it first of all tells us about God, that, that God has the power to deliver us from slavery, even the slavery that we have to death and to sin and evil in all the ways that it is working itself out. Now that's the first reason. Secondly, the resurrection also tells us about Jesus, right? Um, at, at the beginning of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, he says that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by, he goes on, his resurrection from the dead. And so it's the resurrection of Jesus where we learn ultimately and finally and completely who Jesus is. Um, you can look at it this way. Let's imagine that, that everything about Jesus' life was true up until the resurrection, that, that he lived a profound life of teaching and healing and demonstrating his love and inclusion to the poor. And, and let's imagine that just as the Bible says that in the end, this innocent man dies horribly on a Roman cross. Now, he might be remembered as a wonderful figure of history, a, a prophet of God he, he could even be remembered as. But it's very unlikely that anyone would ever conclude that he was divine. But according to the scriptures, the resurrection sets Jesus apart. And it confronts us with his divinity. When Jesus conquered death, as all of those witnesses says, say that he did, it, it's telling us that this Jesus, who was born of the Virgin Mary, was also God, the one who sat above the power of death and sin and evil. Okay, let's, let's sum this up so far. So first of all, the resurrection of Jesus is essential because it tells us about God, that he's our great deliverer. And secondly, it's essential because it tells us about Jesus that he is the son of God, the one who stands above the greatest foe, evil and, and death. And, and with these two thoughts alone then, you can begin to see why Paul says that without the resurrection at the heart of the Jesus story, we, we should be pitied. And we should because the resurrection, without it, we're putting our faith in someone who can't ultimately deliver and in someone who isn't actually the son of God. He's a good teacher, yeah, maybe. Great person, absolutely. But ultimately, he's a dead man, and not one that we should follow as though our, you know, our lives depended on it, right? We certainly shouldn't call him Lord. But these are not the only reason the resurrection is important. And this is the third reason that, that Alistair McGrath sets out. The third reason is that the resurrection also tells us about ourselves. And the resurrection tells us about our future. You notice there at the end of the passage that you read, we encounter this really interesting phrase that I've, I've loved for many years now. It's, Paul says, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, first fruits, right? That's an interesting little expression, isn't it? And in order to make sense of it, we need to have some knowledge of where this little term came from. So let me see if I can explain this to us. In ancient days, back in the, the days of ancient Israel, farmers would, would tend their fields and they were instructed then to watch closely for the first stalk of grain to ripen, or the first olive on the tree to appear. And that first fruit, they were told to go out and wrap a ribbon around it to, to commemorate it. And then later, when it came time for harvest, they were to go out and harvest that first fruit first and take it to the temple as an act of worship. But the first fruit not only was an act of worship, it was also to serve as a promise that just as that first olive came to fruit or that first stalk of grain came to ripen, in like ways, it was a promise that soon a whole harvest would come. The first fruit was the promise there was a coming harvest. And so when Paul says that Jesus' resurrection was a first fruit, it was a promise. 
that just as Jesus rose again from the dead, the first to blossom from death, so too would all who believe. And this is what Paul then goes on to say in, in 1 Corinthians. He says this, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of all of those who have fallen asleep are those who have died. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all have died, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, and then when he comes, those who belong to him, and then the end will come. And this is the true hope and the destiny of the Christian. The promise of the scriptures is not just the resurrection of the dead, but the resurrection of all things. Jesus declares in the end that he will make all things in all of creation new. And that includes you, all of you. And not just your souls, but all of you. Your body is important. It was created by God. And the resurrection says that all of you, your body included, will be made new, whole, beautiful. Paul says in, in verse 42, this body, which is so imperishable, it's raised imperishable. It's raised perfectly. So God has a plan to restore and redeem and renew, resurrect all of creation and all of you. And the resurrection, when seen this way, then it stands, it stands like this huge neon sign in the middle of creation announcing to all who will listen, this is the great hope, the plan, the intention of God. The resurrection, it tells us about God, that he is the deliverer of all creation. It tells us about Jesus, that he is the son of God, the one who stands above all death and evil. And it tells us about ourselves, that there is a hope, there is a hope, and there is a plan beyond the grave, that in Jesus and in his resurrection hope, everything is going to be made new in him. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and give you all of the faith that you need to believe in this amazing message of the resurrection of Jesus. Bless you all.